Okay, welcome everybody. This is section 2.3. Uh, hopefully you already looked at 2.1 and 2.2. This is other graphs that we also in, introduce ourselves to in this course. Um, so uh, this is a really common graph that most people in businesses and stuff use, a bar graph. Uh, usually it's vertical, but you can have a bar graph that's horizontal also. Um, whose heights and lengths represent frequencies, the number of pieces of data. Frequency is the number of data in that category. So this is different from a histogram. If you look at a bar graph, I mean, a bar graph looks like this. If I can get a bar graph looks like this, kind of like a histogram, except a bar graph has gaps. A bar graph has gaps. And in other words, the sides usually don't touch each other. Um, and there's a bar graph also has categories. Uh, we have categories here. Somebody has their mic on. Did you have a question? We can hear it. Could you keep your mic off uh, unless you're asking a question? All right. Uh, so. Here, if we have electronics, dorm decor, clothing and shoes, do you see it has a number that's how high the graph is gonna go. So when we look at this bar graph for this, this is the standard bar graph that we normally see in a business meeting or something. Uh, shoes come up to here, clothing, dorm decor, and electronics is the most. It's something that visual, something that people can see. You see it uh, oftentimes maybe with uh, this COVID, you know, one week it's this, the next week it's that. Like I said, you can have the bar graph vertical where they're going up straight up and down, or you can have the same graph on its side. Uh, they call this a horizontal bar graph. So it doesn't matter which one you do, vertical or horizontal. I think this one's a little easier to see. You can say this one might be easier. Oh, electronics is definitely more. You can say electronics is definitely more here also. So it depends. They're both the same. They're both a bar graph. And I want to pay attention to bar graphs have categories uh, that we have frequency. Do you see shoes, clothing? They're not numbers, they're, you know, not boundaries or limits. They're categories and there's gaps between the bar graph. There's gaps. So that's the difference between if you say, oh, is this a histogram or a bar graph? I can tell that's a bar graph right away because it has gaps. Now, not to say that there's some people do the graphs wrong and <laughs> maybe make a bar graph that's touching each other, uh, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, Pareto chart. Uh, let's look at this Pareto chart. Uh, Pareto chart is used to represent frequency distribution. So Pareto chart, it, it's kind of like a histogram, but it's always arranged from highest to lowest. So we need to know that. That's something I would write, you know, if you have your workbook, that's something I would highlight and put a star next to. Pareto chart goes from highest to lowest, takes our categories and goes from highest to lowest. So it doesn't matter what order they were in, just as long as you're from the highest to the lowest. So it says police calls. Do you see the order here is not from the highest to the lowest, uh, but you do end up putting them in order from the highest to the lowest, like right there. And when you graph it, you go from the highest number of frequency down to the lowest number. So Pareto chart goes from highest frequency to the lowest frequency. So that's all you have to know about Pareto. Um, it's kind of like a histogram. Uh, they're touching. It's not a bar graph. They're touching. 
and it just goes from highest to lowest. Uh, I think a Pareto could have gaps, yes. Um, Jack, good question. They just didn't put them here. Do you see in, in, in this, there's categories. So, you know, there are categories. Um, a Pareto could, is, is basically a bar graph that's in or, put in order from highest to lowest. Uh, if you'll notice there, each of these Pareto charts is a category and it's from highest to lowest. So yes, they could have gaps. I'm not saying it's impo not impossible, but the, the key thing to Pareto chart is always goes from highest to lowest. Good question. There's so many different things that, I mean, the book doesn't actually explain to you uh, in here, but, uh, but yes, you could have gaps because they're categories. They're not, if they were, if they were like boundaries or limits the, or boundaries, you couldn't have gaps because one boundary, the end, the high, the upper boundary of one is the lower boundary of the next. Uh, you couldn't have gaps here. Uh, but for Pareto, you can. These are categories. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a gap there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, time series is, uh, by the way, this is a really common question on the test. Um, which, uh, here, let me just show you this. Is, uh, which graph would you use uh, for percentage of adults who smoke uh, over a period of time? That's the question on a test. I think that's even on the final. Which graph would you use uh, when you want to represent things over a period of time? You use the time series graph. <laughs> time and time. Time is in the answer. <laughs> that's in the question also. So time series just happens over a period of time. Do you see from 1970, 1980, 1990, over a period of time. Uh, so that's what a time series graph is. Draw the x-axis, the y-axis, label the x-axis in years, in this case, since we're talking about years, uh, and then the y-axis in a percentage because they give us percentages. It could be a number or something, just depends but the X axis is always the time. For a time series graph, the X axis is always the time. The Y axis could be a number, a percentage. Uh, in this case, it's a percentage, which is a number also. But the, the X axis, it's, an, it's a year and it's, it's the time that we're, we're separating uh, there, the time that we're using. So when we look at this time series graph, the x-axis is the, the time that we're looking at from 1970 to 2010. You can see, I mean, this graph is pretty, pretty good. I mean, when you look at it, it tells us something. In 1970, 37% of the people smoked. In, 19, in 2010, uh, about 20%. You can tell smoking went down over the last uh, 40 years. Over the last 40 years, the percentage of smokers went down. So, I mean, th th that graph actually tells you stuff. Once again, time series, um, the x-axis is always a, a, a quantity of years, not years of time. The x-axis is always amount of time. It could be years, it could be days, it could be months, it could be seconds. Uh, the x-axis is always an amount of time. Some form of time. And a pie chart. Uh, love this one. <laughs> uh, pie chart is a circle because pies are usually circles if you cook them, if you bake them correctly. <laughs> a time... A pie graph is also sometimes referred to a circle graph. So pie graph, circle graph, um, they both are the same thing. And each wedge, uh, each wedge of the pie is a percentage of the pie. Do you see? Each wedge of the pie is a certain percentage of the frequency. Uh, once again, if we did filled in this 
amount of pi, we would say that 50% of the pi is shaded in. You know, half of the pi is shaded in 50%. So uh, here's a little graph uh, down here. And we want to know this frequency distribution, uh, and we want to do a circle graph or a pi graph pi or circle. I always say circle, but it is a pi. Um, and this is the frequency, 11.2 million. Well, there's total of 30. We have to find the percentage of each. We have to find a percentage of each. And that is the relative frequency, relative frequency uh, formula. Remember, relative frequency is the number for that category divided by the total, by the total. So here we have 11.2 divided by the total of 30. So this first category in my calculator is 11.2 divided by 30. It would be good if I was able to type this in. 11.2 divided by 30 and I get 0 0.373. Um, that's the decimal equivalent. If you multiply it by 100, you get the percentage, which is 37.3%. And they want to take it to one decimal place. So then 8.2, 8.2 divided by 30, I get 0 0.2, 8.2 divided by 30, I get, 0.27333, in other words, 27.3%. So if we look at potato chips, 37%, uh, tortilla chips, 27%, and I scroll down, do you see potato chips is 37% uh, of the graph. This much is 37% of the graph. This much of the graph is 27% of the graph, tortilla chips. And each category is the same thing. You take the amount, the number divided by the total for their relative frequency and then change it to a percent by multiplying by 100. And the whole, the whole pi adds up to 100%. So when add up all these numbers, it should add up to 100%. Okay, so here's a quiz and a test question. I'm going to go, well, let me see what we have down here. Okay, yeah. The, so here is a test question. This, I mean, this is a really hard question. Um, that's why you really have to write this down. Uh, because you will see this in the homework. You will see it, I think, on the quiz. And there's a good chance that it's on the final. I can't remember if this question is on the final or not, but you will see it on the quiz. So the question is, um, how many degrees does uh, pretzels How many degrees does pretzels take up in the pie? How many degrees does pretzels take up in the pie? We know pretzels is 14.3%. But what they're saying is how many degrees they want to know how many degrees in this part of the circle. How many degrees is this part of the, the green part of the circle? Um, does anybody know how many degrees there are in a total circle? If I wanted to measure, you know, this is back in geometry. How many degrees are there in a total circle? Somebody here has to know. Ooh, we got some answers. We got an answer. Let's see. Oh, Shoni, you're close. That's not right. It's 360. 180 is half a circle or the degree for a line. 360 for a total circle. So it's 360 degrees for a total circle. Okay. So 
that's good. So we know now 360 degrees, we use this little tick mark there for a circle. So to find the, the amount of degrees just for pretzels, we take 360 degrees and multiply by its percentage, by its percent. 360 uh, times 14.3%. Uh, on my calculator, 360 times 14.3, and then I'm gonna add the percent symbol. The percent symbol is right above the uh, second. I think that's a percent symbol. How come I can't add the percent symbol in here? Maybe I just push percent there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm trying to figure out why the calculator won't let me add a percent symbol. This is really odd. Uh, 14 percent. There we go. That worked. 360 times. 14.3%. Uh, maybe I'll go 14.3% first. Oh, there, it changed it to degree. It just said degree. Uh, so I just put 14.3% in my calculator first, and then I'm going to multiply it by 360 times 360. And when I multiplied it by 360, I ended up with 51.48. So the answer is 51.48 degrees. The pretzels, this is really 51.48 degrees. From here to here, it's uh, only 51 degrees, about 51.48. Another way of doing this is 360 times 0.143. You can change the percent to a decimal times 0.143 and you get 51.48. So you can change the percentage to a decimal and then it'll tell you how many degrees are in that. Um, so if I ask how many degrees are in potato chips, it would be 360. How many degrees is just the potato chips? 360 times this uh, and the decimal equivalent to that is 0.373. When you put that in your calculator. 360 times 0 0.373, and I get 134%, 0.28%. So this is 134%. You see the whole thing adds up to 360 degrees. Oh, not, not percent, 134 degrees, not percentage. The whole thing adds up to 360 degrees. So when you multiply degrees times a decimal, you get the answer 134 degrees. And once again, if you put all the degrees in there with the decimals, they will add up to 360 degrees. All right, let's move a little further. A dot plot, uh, we're actually going to do a dot plot uh, next Monday on our calculator. So hopefully everybody has their calculator apps and everything ready to go because we're going to do a dot plot on our calculator on Monday. 
a dot plot is a statistical graph and where each data value has a dot on the graph. Each data value has a point and we have an X and a Y value for that point. So, well, let's look at this dot plot. This is a different kind of dot plot. This is a dot plot where we only use one number. We don't use an X and a Y, okay. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, so this is a dot plot where we're just plotting an individual point um, on the horizontal, on one axis, uh, on a horizontal axis. We're actually gonna do a dot plot where we do X and Y, where each point has two coordinates, an X and a Y. This one just has one coordinate, just an X. Each one of these uh, just has an X. Uh, so if we look at this, if I scroll down a little bit and look at this, each number here in the data is represented by a dot. 19 is right here. Uh, and if you look at our graph, there's another 19 somewhere on here, right here. You see, there's another 19. Uh, this is represents four. This number nine is, there's 10. There's num the first number nine. And obviously, uh, according to this graph, there are two more nines. Here's one and here's one. So you can stack up these dots for each of the data points. And you can see kind of, you can kind of like look at this Look at this, there's a data point way over here. You can kind of see how this graph is, uh, is situated. Can you tell me, is this graph skewed left or skewed right? Can somebody tell me if this is skewed left or skewed right? And it is skewed right. Right, do you see the right side has the least amount of data? This, this piece that goes way over here. So uh, most of the data is on the left. So this, this data is skewed right. The least amount of data is on the right side. Uh, perfect situation for us to bring that up again. Um, in the homework, you will uh, have to do this, I believe. Uh, I know in the quiz, you're gonna probably have to do that. I know on the, on the final exam, there's a question. You they're gonna give you four of these. Final exam is multiple choice. They'll give you four of these dot plots and say, which is the correct? All you have to do is find out which one doesn't have the correct number in the correct spot. Uh, stem leaf is, I think this is the last graph we're going to cover, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. So stem leaf, um, the stem is always, the stem is usually the left digit. It might be the left two digits, but the stem is the left digit or the left two digits, depending on how we look at this. Usually the left digit, uh, the left digit or more digits. The leaf is always the right uh, single digit, right single digit. So the, the leaf is always the right single digit. So if I looked at this, I know the five is classified as a leaf and the two is classified as a stem. Stem. Once again, stem, leaf. Uh, so if I know stem leaf now, <laughs> uh, we just, we, we put these in uh, the stem leaf if you look, this is called the stem leaf and, and don't worry about the unordered stem leaf right now. Uh, we're gonna always order them in, in our homework and on the tests. We normally always order them. So unordered, the left side is the stem. So 
if I say the stems are the left side, can somebody tell me this is, by the way, this data is represented by this stem leaf down here. This data is represented by the stem leaf. Can somebody tell me what this two I just circled represents? What does that two represent? Anybody know? I mean, what number other than two? It, <laughs> it doesn't represent two, by the way. What number does it represent? Can, and somebody's typing it in. If I say it's a stem, it represents 20, yes. That two, this two represents 20. The, you know, it's the stem parts, the 30, the 30, the 50. This two represents 20. This five represents the leaf. So that five actually represents 25. Do you see the stem and the leaf? This zero represents 20, the stem and the leaf. This three in that spot represents 23. We have that data up here. Those three pieces of data are all our 20s. We have a 25, we have a 20, and we have a 23. There are no other 20s because all the 20s are in that area. And this is the 20s in order where you go from smallest to largest on the leaves. Uh, these stems are always going from smallest to largest. Um, so this number three is represented by 13. The stem is the 10 and the three is the leaf. So that three is 13. Do you see we have a 13 in the data? This is 32, 32, 32, 32. We should have four 32s in our data. One, two, three, four. Because our stem leaf showed four 32s. So for each number, you have to put a leaf in there. You can't just put one leaf saying, oh, there's 32, 32. But you have to put a leaf for each number up there. OK, so that's the stem leaf. When you do it in the homework, when you see it on the test, we're always going to put it in order. Uh, take, put it out of order, see what happens. I think the, the homework marks it wrong. <laughs> so it should be in order where we go from lowest to highest in the leaves. Um, they showed this graph, and I, I think you're going to have one on the homework, uh, like, I don't know what they call it, a back-to-back -back stem leaf. Uh, normally, you don't see these. You won't see it on the final, but you will, or I don't think you'll even see it on the quiz, but you'll see it in the homework. Uh, you have all this data for Atlanta. You see, have all this data for Philadelphia, and you want to compare it. Do you see this? You want to compare it. This, let me try, there we go. I'm trying to get my pen back. Okay, this two represents 20. Do you see this is 25? For Philadelphia, Philadelphia, we have a 25. Uh, for Atlanta, we should have a 26. Do you see this 26, 28, and a 29? 26, 28, and a 29. And they did put them in order, but for Atlanta, the order is going this way. For Philadelphia, the order is going this way. So they just called that a back-to-back -back stem leaf. The middle part is the stem. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So I just wanted to show you that because you'll see one of those in the homework. But you shouldn't see one of those back-to-backs on the test. And that is section 2.3.